Now, the program that we've just heard was given by Harry Roy in person. Now, perhaps you'd like to listen to a talk called You Have Been Listening to a Recording. MJL Pulling, Superintendent Eng Engineer of the BBC's Recording Service, concludes this series with a description of some of the engineering aspects of the work. Mr. Pulling. On the last three Saturdays, Linton Fletcher has been telling you something of the uses which are made of sound recording by the BBC. Today, I want to take you into the domain of the sound recording engineer, with particular reference to the BBC's work. Now, let's start with something we all know, the gramophone record. When you come to think of it, the gramophone record, or disc, which you can buy for a few shillings, is a very remarkable article. Its size, shape, and weight are small and convenient, and if it be a speech record, it contains all the information that would be found in four pages of an average book. But, and this is the important point, it will reproduce for you, in addition, all the intonations and inflections of the speaker's voice, which the written and printed word can never do. Then, too, it's every bit as permanent, and a large number of copies can be produced just as easily as copies of a book are printed. If it's a record of, say, orchestral music, it can be made to convey an impression to your senses which cannot be conveyed, or at least uh, cannot be conveyed to order, in any other way, unless you happen to be one of those gifted people who can read an orchestral score. And what's perhaps even more striking, though the disc contains no energy within itself, given a suitable apparatus, it can be made to produce a sufficient volume of sound to fill, let us say, the Albert Hall. Now, we use the disc recording system very extensively, though in a different way from that in which it is used by firms who make gramophone records. Our requirements differ from theirs in this important respect. For broadcasting purposes, we must be able to replay our discs almost immediately they have been made. Now, commercial firms, because they have not got this problem, can adopt a more leisurely process. They record on wax, which, due to its softness, can't conveniently be played without damage. They then form, by electrical means, a metallic negative of the original wax disc. And from this negative, or matrix, to give it its technical name, a large number of discs can be pressed all identical with one another and with the original wax disc. These are the discs which you buy at the gramophone dealers. Such a process would take too long and would be too complex for our purposes. We record instead on a disc consisting of a thin metal base which has been coated with lacquer in much the same way as the body of a car is sprayed. We make our recording on this lacquer surface and when completed, the disc looks at first glance very much like a normal gramophone record. The difference, of course, is that the lacquer surface is not so hard as that of the gramophone record, but it is hard enough to allow the disc to be played straight away using a normal gramophone turntable and a pickup of rather special design to ensure that the needle does not damage the grooves. These discs can be played quite a number of times in this way, without deterioration. And for our purposes, this is usually all that's necessary. If a particular disc needs to be used over and over again, or if it's wanted as a permanent record, we have copies made in much the same way as the gramophone companies make copies of their original wax discs. Apart from the disc system, we use two other methods of sound recording. In one of these, known as the tape system, the recording is made magnetically on a length of steel tape. The tape is thin and only an eighth of an inch wide. But even so, a reel of this, long enough for half an hour's recording, is about a mile and three quarters in length and weighs very nearly 30 pounds. Because of this, it's obviously a system which does not lend itself to the recording of programs for historical purposes. But it has this peculiarity, 
that you cannot tell by just looking at a strip of tape whether it has been recorded on or not. And, in fact, a recording which has been made on a reel of tape can be very easily removed when no longer wanted, and the tape used again for a subsequent recording. In this way, the same tape can be used over and over again a very large number of times. And so the chief use to which this system is put is the recording of programs which are to be reproduced soon afterwards and are not required to be kept permanently. The third method is known as the film system, though the film used is not a photographic film. Rather like the tape, it's thin and narrow. The material of which it is made is transparent, but it has a very thin surface coating which makes it opaque. We record on this film by using a tiny, specially shaped sapphire cutter to cut away part of the coating, thus producing a transparent soundtrack of varying width along the center of the strip of film. During this process, the film, which runs for a quarter of an hour, is being wound at a steady speed onto an empty spool. When the recording is finished, the film has only to be wound back onto its original spool and it's then ready to be replayed without treatment of any kind. So much then for the apparatus. We are often asked, how is it if a reel of film lasts for only a quarter of an hour that you can record a program of half an hour, half an hour and more? The answer to this is simply that in a recording room we always have two identical machines. As soon as the record on the first machine is nearly complete, the second machine is set going and the program is switched over to it, sometimes with and sometimes without an overlap. When we come to replay the recording, a similar arrangement is necessary. And, of course, precautions have to be taken to avoid a gap, or equally bad, a repetition at the point of changeover. Three weeks ago, you heard my colleague, Linton Fletcher, say, We tell you when you're listening to a recording. Or, to put it in another form, do we ever pretend that you're listening to real people in the studio when in fact we're playing a record? Now, the answer to that is that we do tell you and that we do not pretend. That's quite true. But from the recording engineer's point of view, the criterion which he must always apply to his work is that it should be so near an approach to the original that even a critical listener could be deceived by it. Now, there are three very important ingredients which go towards the making of a good recording. Firstly, the materials which we use must be consistently of a high standard. Not always a simple matter in wartime, particularly when you realize that we are recording on an average 2,500 discs every week. Secondly, the apparatus itself must be of efficient design and must be maintained in first-class condition. To quote a simple example, in any recording system, the recording material, whatever it is, must move at an absolutely constant speed through the recording mechanism. If there is any speed fluctuation, then instead of this, you will get this. A rather painful effect, known to recording engineers as wow. Lastly, the machines must be skillfully operated. This demands a considerable degree of manual dexterity and of mental alertness on the part of the recording engineers. If you were to go into one of our recording rooms at this moment, you would find probably an experienced recording engineer and a woman operator as assistant. A few days ago, we were recording one of the Brains Trust programs. And this is what was taking place in the film recording room about three quarters of an hour before the program was due to start. Cut that, will you? Hello, film room. Yes, we'll be taking any questions. We'll let you know we want the lines. Yes. 
Right ho, goodbye. I think I've got four good sapphires. Shall we start testing? Yes, lace, lace up that short reel, will you? Whilst I line up the amplifiers. Now switch on the tone, will you? Turn on. Right. Now a noiseless track. Twenty. Zero. Seventeen point five. Good. Now you set? Yes, ready to cut. Motor on. Suction. Ready? Yes, run her. That's enough. Let's look at it. Set up the microscope. Hmm. Let's take a cut and see how it sounds. That's an idea. Uh, run it back. We will listen to it without the blower. Setting up for any questions? Yes, this stuff is not so good, actually. I'm going to try another. Right, well, let me know if you have any trouble uh, and tell me when the lines are over, will you? Would you like me to test this sapphire? Would you mind? A motor on. Suction. And so the preliminary testing period goes on. Now, returning to the recording room half an hour or so later. Sapphires, enough film. I wonder if you'd tell the SME we're getting the lines now. Okay. Ready for lines, control. Lines over? Just coming now. Studio on line four, control on line seven. Thank you. That's line four, nothing there yet. Well, let me speak to the studio. Hello. Yes, this is film. We're ready for a test from you. Yes, as soon as you can, please. Are they all there? Good. <laughs> right, yes, yes. Mm. We're standing by then. There we are. The viscous in the day comes from Dr. Goebbels. He wants to know why people shouldn't be able to smoke in the studio. I can think of no reason whatever. Would you mind, uh, Dad? Joe can think of no reason whatever except pure official intransigence and obstruction. Right, host studio. Thank you very much. I should think that will be all right. It sounds as though the question master might be a shade heavy when the other speakers are in, but uh, if you move the mic a shade down table, it will probably take care of that. Right. Now, are you both happy? Yes. Yes, fine here. Good. Now let's check that everything's ready. We've got four tins. The Q markers have been tested. Yes, we've got the new uh, line up too for the amplifiers, you know now. What's on that? Shut that door! That's that disc, disc again. Noise, yes. well, they'll have to keep quiet. They must be able to concentrate. Now tell the, tell the studio they're ready for a Q, will you? Ready for a Q, studio. Right. We'll go ahead in ten seconds from now. Cutting! I'm sure it's a very great relief to all of us to read in the papers that it has now been officially laid down that the Brains Trust is neither a... Well, I hope that this brief talk may have given you a slight glimpse of the engineering aspects of our recording activities. You have been listening to M.J.L. Pulling, Superintendent Engineer of the BBC's Recording Service, giving the fourth and last talk in the series, you have been listening to a recording. <laughs>